Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakallah khair. Uh, for uh, coming to the talk. Alhamdulillah, good to see some new faces as well. Um, for the people who just came today, just to let you know, everything you see on the right hand side, well, my right hand side, your left hand side, is absolutely for free. And uh, yeah. Um, also, I think some people are not coming because of the protest, maybe. Maybe. Um, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for Hong Kong and uh, you know, rectify the situation which is really, really dire. Um, a lot of us are looking, asking us as well from outside that you know, what's going on in Hong Kong is it affecting Muslims. Um, like anything else, you know, Muslims are part of the society and we want to make sure that you know, we can contribute goodness towards it. Um, so even if we're not on the streets, it doesn't mean we're not getting hurt, right? We are still part of it. So May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rectify the situation. All right, so today, um, the talk we have for you, which is pretty much every year we're doing this, and uh, some of you may know a lot of the information which I'm going to share with you, and some of the information might be new for you. Um, either way, it's going to be something which will be a good reminder for myself and inshallah for yourself. Those who are watching online, you can share the video inshallah. So, the topic is virtues and myths of Muharram and Ashura. So Muharram, as we know, is... Uh, I'm going to try to keep this interactive as well as much as I can. As you know, I like to keep it interactive. So Muharram is uh, which month of the Islamic calendar? First one. First one, alhamdulillah. If I, we know, obviously, you know, all the Georgian calendar months, but Islamic one, we're quite bad, right? Um, but alhamdulillah, we know Muharram. So Muharram is the first month. Indeed... There are many rewards and blessings that can be gained throughout the Islamic year, not only in Ramadan. One of the things that the Muslim Ummah um, is ignorant about sometimes is that we think Ramadan and that's it. You know, after Ramadan, sorry, what's going on? Um, you know, and, and then that's when, you know, we're losing so many opportunities to get the Ajr and to get, of course, blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why we need to remind ourselves that, yes, we have 12 months and Ramadan is the most special month. But there are other months which Allah has made special um, for different reasons. So Muharram is definitely one of them. The blessed month of Muharram, which basically means sanctified, is the first one of the Hijri calendar, as we said, and is one of the four sacred months concerning which Allah uh, Jal says. Now, before I show you the four months, anybody knows the four months? Muharram. Muharram. Dhul Hijjah, uh -uh. <laughs> sacred months. Everybody thinks of Ramadan as being a sacred, but Allah did not mention Ramadan as a sacred month. It is special, but it wasn't mentioned as a sacred month. There's two more. Shaban. No, good try. What's, uh, what's after Shaban? After Shaban is... Okay, starts with R. Before Shaban is Rajab. That's it. Yeah, before Shaban. Sorry, yeah, my, my mistake. My mistake, Ramadan. Rajab. And then before Dhul Hijjah, Dhul Qaeda. Dhul Qaeda. So, Allah Azza wa Jal says in Quran, chapter number 9, verse number 36, Indeed, the number of months with Allah is 12. In terms of the lunar and of course, in terms of the solar as well, we have 12. Um, in the register of Allah, from the day He created the heavens and the earth, of these, four are sacred. Three of them come straight away, like one after the other. Dhul Qada, which is the 11th month, Dhul Hijjah, which is the 12th month, Muharram, which is the first month, and of course, Rajab. Okay, um, that is the correct religion. So do not wrong yourself during therein. Now, this is something I wanted to like pick out, um, and this is something that the scholars pick out as well, this last part. Do not wrong yourself therein, meaning in the sight of Allah, these four months hold a special place, right? And if something holds a special place in the sight of Allah, Surely as Muslims, we need to like, you know, like, okay, hold on. Why is it special? Once we know it's special, Allah reminds us that we shouldn't do wrong therein. I mean, we shouldn't do wrong in any month. Yes. Um, but when Allah specifies it, that do not do wrong therein, meaning that if you do a wrong, most likely that wrong will be regarded quite high in Allah's sight. Um, so we need to be very, very careful. Um, again, we think of Ramadan. And we think, you know what, we'll stay away from all the wrongs. Um, Allah says in these four months as well, 
for different reasons, do not do wrong therein. Um, today is the 6th of September in Hong Kong. So it's the 6th of Muharram. Just those who are watching, you might be different because of the moon, calendar, uh, moon sighting and stuff. So we're on the 6th of Muharram. So we have still have about 24 days left, inshallah. Right, next thing about Muharram, which is special, is the fact that it is the best fast after Ramadan. Abu Huraira anhu, reported that he وسلم, was asked as to which prayer was the most excellent after the prescribed prayer, meaning after the obligatory prayer. And which fast was most excellent after the month of Ramadan. So before I show you, do you know which is the prayer that's the most excellent after the Fard, which is the, you know, the five daily prayers, the Hajjud. Sisters, any answers? The Hajjud? Doha. Doha, okay, interesting. What about fast? Which fast is most excellent after the month of Ramadan? Ashura. Ashura, yeah, because you're getting a lot of things, right? So, Rasulullah said, prayer offered in the middle of the night, which is the Hajjud, and the most excellent fast is in the fasting of Muharram. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, then in Muharram, we have one specific day, which we always talk about, what well, we should be talking about, which is the day of Ashura. So Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, said, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa came to Medina, and he saw the Jews fasting on the day of Ashura. Okay. I think a lot of you know this hadith as well. So what did he say? He asked the, the Sahaba, he said, what is this? As in, why are they doing this? Right? And they said, the Jews said, this is a righteous day. It is the day when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved the children of Israel from the enemies. Which enemy was that? So Musa fasted on this day. Yes, Pharaoh. Right? Pharaoh. Right, so Allah Subhanahu wa Taala saved Musa and his people from Fir'aun. Right, um, and because he saved them on this day, the people of Israel took this day as a righteous day. And what did they do? They fasted. Right. So the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "We have more right to Musa Alaihi Salam than you." Who is the you here? The Jews. Right, because he's talking to the Jews. He said, "We, we as in who?" The Muslims, right? We have more right to Musa alayhi salam than you. So he fasted on that day and he commanded the Muslims to fast on that day. Just two things I want to, uh, you know, I was looking at this and I thought, you know what? It's amazing that the, the second part here says this is a righteous day. So he commanded, so people, well, Musa alayhi salam fasted. If you think about it, like everything in Islam, whenever Allah or the prophets made a day, a special day, the way they celebrated that day was by doing what? Fasting. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was born on a Monday, right? How did he celebrate that? Fasting, right? The day of Arafat, special day again. What are we told to do? Fast. Right, so this is a sunnah of the prophets that the way that the prophets wanted to sanctify or to make this special day or any special day which Allah and the prophets have recorded and made sure it continues centuries until now and forever is by fasting. Right, they never did anything else. The, the, the two celebrations, in terms of gifts and everything, are Eid al Fitr and Eid al Adha. Right. But in terms of other days, which are righteous days, no doubt, like I said, you know, Musa alayhi salam took that day as a righteous day as well. So Ashura is even more, is even before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam, that was already sanctified. And actually, we will talk about it in a bit, that even before Musa alayhi salam, this day was already considered righteous by another prophet as well, which I'll show you in a bit. Um, and the second part, which is about this one, right? We have more, right? So he fasted, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam fasted on that day and he commanded the Muslims to fast. So the day of Ashura was actually a compulsory fast. Before Ramadan became Fard, Ashura was a Fard fast for the Muslims. 
And then when Ramadan became fard, Rasulullah said, it's no longer a fard, it's a sunnah. Right? But before, the early Muslims, they used to consider Ashura as a fard farce. Meaning what? When something becomes fard, when something becomes compulsory, what happens then? It's a must. So if you do it, what happens? You get reward. If you don't do it, you get sin. Sunnah, if you do it, you get reward. If you don't do it, you get nothing. Right? No sin. So that's the difference, right? Um, and that's why, of course, the fart became sunnah. And this is what I was going to talk about. So it was already a special day, even doing jahiliya. What is jahiliya? In English? It starts with I. When people don't know things. Ig Ignorance. 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 Sorry, I'm an English teacher, so I like to, you know... <laughs> do this um, yeah you can answer on the on the on the chat as well so even in the time of jahiliya this was a practice the practice of fasting on ashura was known even before the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam message so it was reported by aisha radiallahu anha who said the people of jahiliya used to fast on fast on that day meaning the people of non basically non muslims Right? They even fasted on this day for whatever reason. We don't know the reason. But they even consider this day to be something special. Uh, uh, Imam al Qurtubi uh, said, Perhaps the Quraysh used to fast on that day on the basis of some previous law, like that of Ibrahim. So he, he said, even all the way back to Ibrahim, the people used to fast on this day. Right? And again, just some history for you. Okay, the virtues of fasting on the day of Ashura. Does anybody know the virtues of fasting on the day of Ashura? What are the benefits of fasting on the day of Ashura? Sins are forgotten. Exempted, cool, forgot. Okay, yeah, sins are forgiven for the last year. Last year or the coming year as well? Both. You think both? What about you, sister? Just last year? Yes, that's why I wanted to confuse you guys. Um, so, okay. Yeah, um, you're on the right track. So, Ibn Abbas, he said, I never saw the Prophet ﷺ seeking to fast on a day more preferable to him than this day, i.e. the day of Ashura or this month, i.e. the month of Ramadan. This is a full hadith. So basically, in terms of month, of course, there's nothing that beats Ramadan. Nothing, right? But the second one could be Muharram or it could also be Shaban. Because also, there's also Hadith about Shaban. That Rasulullah was eager to fast in the month of Shaban as well. But Muharram, some scholars take, can take a, a, a level higher. Why? Because it's a sacred month in the sight of Allah. Right? It's one of the four sacred months. But in terms of day, like a special day, Rasulullah used to love to fast. On the day of Ashura. And of course that could be because it was a sunnah of the prophets before him as well. Right? So he wanted to continue that sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ said, For fasting on the day of Ashura, I hope that Allah will accept it as an expiation for the past year. We would like even coming year. But which day is it that will it allows us to forgive our sins for the last year and the coming year? Which day is that? Arafat. Arafat, which was of course last month. Um, inshallah, you know, hopefully most of us fasted and may Allah accept our fast. Um, just on a side note, the sins that are being forgiven here are what kind of sins? The major sins or the minor sins? sins. No. The ulama have defined sins as major and minor. Right? So these sins that are being talked about here, you know, just by doing one fast, what kind of sins are being forgiven? The major sins or the minor sins or both? Just the minor. What do you think? No idea. Both? We would like to be both, wouldn't it? Yeah. Everything, inshallah. Allah is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. He can. But the ulama says as the minor sins. For the major sins to be forgiven, what do you need to do? If you want the major sins to be forgiven, what do you need to do? Can you give me some example of major sins? 
Zina, yeah, that's a major sin. Anything else? Alcohol, not praying, right? Murder, right? So all of these sins, major sins, what do you need to do to get them forgiven? Starts with T. Repent. Repentance and tawbah. Right? That's the only way that Allah is going to forgive you for that. Of course, and then do good deeds and don't go back to that sin again. Right? Um, that's true repentance. That's true tawbah. But the, this one, the scholars say it's the minor sins. But again, Allah is a Rahman a Rahim. He may even forgive the major sins as well. May Allah forgive our sins in entirely. Right? Now, Fasting Ashura, when one has days to make up from Ramadan. So Ramadan was, of course, what? Four months ago now? Yeah, four months ago, roughly, right? Five months ago? Five months ago. Six months ago. Six. Seven months ago? No, six months ago. Um, anyway, so it's been quite a, quite a time since Ramadan. So there are people who ask that, you know, um, I didn't fast my... There were some days, you know, I didn't fast in Ramadan. Can I use this day as Ashura to make up my fast of Ramadan and have the, the, the reward of fasting Ashura as well. Right, just like we had Arafat, people ask the same question. Just like the six days of Shawwal, people ask the same question. You know, that, you know, those are, uh, they're not compulsory fast, they're voluntary fast. But can we double the intention? Right? Now, here's some uh, advice by the scholars. So Muslims must, firstly, Muslims must hasten to make up any misfast after Ramadan. In case you have any misfast, you need to make it up as soon as possible. So that they will be able to fast Arafat and Ashura and Shawwal, or even the Mondays and Thursdays, the three days of the month, all of that voluntary fast without any problem, um, and not having to double the intention. But the scholars did differ <coughs> concerning the ruling on observing voluntary fast. Before making up the missed days from Ramadan or other obligatory fast, just like the fulfillment of a vow. Do you know what's a vow? V-O-W. Do you know what that is? Yeah. When you make a promise to Allah. Right? That if this happens, I'll fast. Right? So if that's a vow, that's a promise to Allah. So that becomes a compulsory fast upon you. Right? That's no longer a voluntary fast. Right? A lot of people mistake that. You made a promise with Allah. Right? You can't, oh, you got it. Okay, fine. That's fine. You know, thanks Allah. That's fine. You can't do that. You're dealing with Allah here, right? So, um, you need to, so some scholars do say that you need to make up the obligatory fast before the, um, a voluntary one. Right? So, the Hanafi, of course, we, we're just going to show you the four madahib. The Hanafi jurists say that this is permissible. Yeah, that you can make, that you can do the voluntary fast first and then the Ramadan misfast. The Shafi also say it's permissible, but they say it's disliked, makru. Right? They say it is, it is disliked. The Hanbali say that it is haram. Um, and because they say and a person must give priority to the obligatory fast until he has made them up. Right? Now, of course, just for myself, my opinion, everybody have their own opinion for us. For me, I would, I'm more towards the Hanbali one for this. And the reason being that that is the most severest in terms of ruling, right? So you want to be on the safe side, don't you, as a Muslim, right? On the day of judgment, you know, if this comes to, you know, play and they look at the different thing. If Hanafi is, the Hanafi's, you know, way of thinking is correct, Alhamdulillah. If Shafi's thing is, Alhamdulillah. But if Hanbali's is correct and you followed Hanaf, if Hanbali's you know school of thought was correct in this matter, but you follow Hanaf, uh, Hanafi's, you might be in trouble. Do you understand what I mean, right? So as a Muslim, we are told to always be on the safe side, which means that if you have any misfast of Ramadan, you should make them up as soon as possible before you start intending to fast these voluntary fasts. Again, there is difference of opinion on this. All right, now we're going to go down the road of innovations, which is a huge topic, especially for Ashura, like anything else. And <clears throat> this is one of the traps of shaitan, that if you look at our calendar, she if has, you look at... She has celebrated this Ashura like mm, I'm going to talk about this as well. So, you know, 
whenever there's a special event in the Islamic calendar, whenever there's something righteous, whenever there's something sacred, shaitan will always try to ruin that day. And the only way he can do that is by two things. What are the two things? He makes them Muslims, of course, because we will, we will be celebrating that. But there's two things that shaitan loves more than anything else. One is, starts with S. There's an Arabic word, the unforgivable sin. Which sin will Allah never forgive? Shirk. Shirk. Right? The first thing he loves is shirk. What's the second thing he loves? Starts with B. Is the Arabic of innovation. Bida. Bida. Right? So if he can't get Muslims to do shirk, he goes to plan B. And plan B is get them to do bida. And bida means innovation. So there are so many innovations that are happening on Ashura, just like there's so many innovations that are happening in many other times of the year as well. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us from these innovations. Right. So what has been proven um, and legislated on the day of Ashura is to fast. Nothing more. Right? So why add? That's the first question. Right? I think the mic's gone. No, it's not. Um, the hadith just said fast. Fast, fast, fast. You have four or five different hadith from the Jews, and obviously the, it's all about fasting, nothing else. Christians do uh, take Ashura as a special day? I'm not sure about that. Not sure about that. So, Shaykh al Islam ibn Tahmiyyah was asked about the authenticity of things that people do on Ashura to seek reward, such as wearing coal, which is surma. In, in the subcontinent, we say surma, right? Taking a bath, ghusl, wearing hina, shaking hands with one another, cooking huboom, grains, and so on. If you look at all these things, what does it remind you of? Eid. Eid. Right? It's as if you are taking Ashura as a day of Eid. But, again, we go back to the, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Did he ever said that this is a day of Eid? No, he didn't. Right? And again, you know, these people who are doing this, may Allah guide them and guide us all. They're doing this for what reason? They feel this will give them reward. So their intention is good. Right? They're not doing this to gain sins. They don't think they're going to get sinned by doing this, will they? They're thinking good. But the problem is what? It's not on the way of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. As Shaykh Ibn Taymiyyah, he said, for, 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 any, for any action to be accepted by Allah, it needs to meet two things. What are those two things? For any act, for any deed, for any good deed, of course, to be accepted by Allah, it needs to meet two things. It needs to meet two criteria. What's the first thing? Which is the first hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari. No. When you're doing an action, when you're going to do an action, you think it's a good, you think it's a good action, so you want to do it. It needs to have two things. Number one, the intention must be for the sake of Allah. Right? You do the good action, but you do it for someone else. Will that be accepted by Allah? Uh -uh. The deed is gone. Right? You're trying to do dawah, you're trying to give charity, you're trying to be good to your parents, and then you're doing it to get likes or shares or comments, trying to get fame. Allah says, Go take that fame. I don't need your deed. And that's what's going to happen on Day of Judgment as well. May Allah protect our deeds. What's the second thing? So you have the good intention, you have the right that, you know, Ya Allah, I'm doing this for you only. What's the second thing? Which is very important as well. The methodology, meaning the way you're doing it, is it the way that the Prophet or the Sahaba did it? Because remember, Islam, is it complete? Is Islam complete? Yeah, the religion is complete. Can we add or take out? No, we can't. We don't have the authority to do that, right? And who were the best of people to practice Islam? The Sahaba, who was the best of man. The Prophet ﷺ. So if there was any act of worship that we should do, 
Do you think they would have missed out? No way. And this is why they say, if you want your act to be accepted by Allah, it needs to meet these two things. Because some people will say, you know what, I'm, I have good intention. You know, I'm doing this for Allah. But you're doing things which the Prophet never did. So it won't be accepted. On the other hand, people are doing things that the Prophet did. But the intention is wrong. Again, it won't be accepted. So it goes back to this, that even though they are seeking reward by doing this, it wasn't something the Prophet did. So it cannot be accepted in that category. Now, then there's another extreme to the innovations, which is this. Some other people mark this day by grieving and mourning. Not drinking water, wailing, crying, and even tearing their clothes. And we know the group of people who do that, right? Um, exactly. So this is a huge innovation. I mean, the second one, applying kohol, and that's also an innovation, but this is on another level, right? And we'll talk about this more because it needs to be talked about. So anyway, when, when, the, when Ibn Taymiyyah was asked this question, he replied saying, nothing to that effect has been reported in any sound hadith from the Prophet ﷺ or his companions. None of the imams encouraged such things. Neither the four imams or any other. So there's absolutely no way you can say, well, actually, well, no, no, nothing, nothing. There's no way to justify your actions. No reliable scholars have narrated anything like this, neither from the Prophet, of, as we said, uh, nor the Tabi'een and no authentic report, not even a weak report um, in regards to all of these actions we just mentioned in the previous slide. No hadith of this nature, as we said already. Um, <coughs> some of the, some narrators reported a hadith which goes like this: Whoever puts kohol, which is the surma, not alcohol, um, whoever puts surma in his eyes on the day of Ashura, he will not suffer from eye disease in that year. And whoever takes bath on the day of Ashura will not get sick in that year. And of course, this is a fabricated hadith. There's, there's, there's no sana. There's no, there's no. It's just, it's just fabricated. And the thing is that you know the people who are doing these things. Obviously, they must have heard from somewhere, right? Look, if, if, of course, if you didn't know this, if somebody told you, hey, put, put some surma on day of Ashura, you won't, you know, you'll what? You'll never get eye disease for that. You're like, really? Oh man, come on, man, Bismillah, right? Of course, right? Because you just want baraka, you want, you know, reward. And again, if somebody told you to take a shower on that day, you'll never get sick on that. Oh, really? Okay, fine. Bismillah. But again, and this is why we need knowledge, right? We need to verify every act of worship we do. Because on the day of judgment, you can't say, well, my brother told me that, my father told me this, my mom told me this. Uh -uh. It's going to be you and your actions, right? Um, they also reported another fabricated hadith, which is quite interesting as well. Um, it sounds good, but again, it's, it's just fabricated. Where they say that the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever is generous to his family on the day of Ashura, Allah will be generous to him for the rest of the year. Reporting, and this is, of course, we put it in bold. Reporting any hadith from the Prophet ﷺ, which is not from the authentic, is, as I said, is, 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 is putting you to the fire. Because the Prophet wasallam said, whoever narrates from me a lie, let him take a seat in the hellfire. Because when you are not careful what you are passing about the Prophet in terms of passing the messages and stuff like that, then it, it, it can change the religion. Right? And that's why it's a grave sin. And just as a side note again, please always verify any hadith you get on your mobile phone. It might even say Sahih Bukhari. It might even say that. But it's your responsibility to check before you pass on. You know, it sounds good. Oh, I'll just pass. And now, of course, WhatsApp has put a restriction to five, right? You can only do five forwards now. Alhamdulillah. Um, but, you know, people want to get, you know, oh, that sounds amazing. Let me just pass on. But what, I mean, that person who passed to you should have checked as well. But once it comes to you, you have responsibility to check by yourself. Yeah, it might take some time. Yeah, you know, you might have to ask some question. But whenever you get something, it says the Prophet ﷺ said, you need to check that is this really authentic. 
because you don't want, you don't want to be part of the sin inshallah all right other myths and misconceptions of ashura so there are other myths myths basically meaning just fairy tales um, but in the, in, the, in in a bad way Right. There are other myths and misconceptions with regards to Ashura that have managed to find their way into the minds of the unlearned, the ignorant, but have no support of authentic Islamic sources. Some very common of them are these. I didn't know some of these as well until we did some research, which are quite interesting. One. So some people say this is the day on which Adam salam was created. No support whatsoever for this. Somebody made it up and it's still going on. People still believe this, but there's no, there's no evidence. Two, this is the day when Ibrahim salam was born. Again, no evidence whatsoever. Another one is, this is the day when Allah accepted the repentance of Adam salam. Did, did Allah accept the repentance of Adam salam? Do you know which repentance is, is, is being mentioned here? What did he do? No, what did what, what was the mistake that Adam al Islam did? Not to eat the apple. Okay, not to eat the apple. What did you say, sister? He ate the apple. He ate the apple as well. Uh, there, there was a reason I brought this up. Because this is something again I didn't know this until I started searching. So yes, he ate something. But did you know it wasn't an apple? Do you know where this concept of an apple came from? Well, the Adam's apple, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, actually. But no, but where did this come from? The concept of an apple, where did it come from? It didn't come from the Islam. It didn't come from the Quran. The Quran basically says that he ate from the forbidden tree. That's it. It was a fruit, but we don't know the fruit. But do you know the concept of apple? Where did it come from? The Christians. Right? And the Muslims accepted it, and now everything is apple. So, Alhamdulillah, it's good that you know I brought this up. It helps you to understand. So, next time somebody asks you, what did Adam eat? Forbidden fruit. Exactly. That's it. Alhamdulillah. See, you learned something. So, when he ate that, what did he do? He asked for repentance. Did Allah accept his repentance? Yes, he did. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, he sent him to the earth, but he did accept his repentance. So, some people say, that Ashura was the day when he accepted, but there's no evidence for this. Another one, another uh, fabricated thing, misconception is that this is the day when doomsday will take place. Meaning the, the day of resurrection. Again, there is no supporting evidence for this. Uh, oh, this one already mentioned, whoever takes a bath on Ashura will never get ill. Yeah. All these and other similar whims and illusions are totally baseless. And the narrations referred to in to in this respect are not worthy of any credit um, they're more again you know if if there was evidence alhamdulillah we'll believe in it right but there's no evidence we should be careful not to believe in them and to pass them around right now comes the the most sensitive matter regarding the day of Ashura, which is regarding al Hussein. who is al Hussein? the grandson of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who was the other grandson that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to love? Hussein and Hassan. Right? So, Hussein radiallahu anhu was killed on this day. There is evidence for that. Right? This is backed by evidence. But, some people attribute the sanctity, meaning the, the value, the level of Ashura to the martyrdom, to the shaheed, of Al Hussein, right? They say, oh, Hussein was, was killed on this day, so this is why Ashura is a special day. But, of course, no doubt the martyrdom of Al Hussein is one of the most tragic episodes of our history. Um, but, the sanctity of Ashura cannot be ascribed to this event for the simple reason that its sanctity was established during the days of the Prophet. Much earlier than the birth of Al Hussein. Why? Because what happened? Go back to the story of the Jews. Right? The Prophet ﷺ saw them fasting. They said, Why are they fasting? Because Musa was saved and his people were saved from Firaun. So, what did they do? They fasted. So, the sanctity is there. 
That's that's them building, and then what the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we're gonna fast. So that's that's it. We don't need anything else, right? So that's when Ashura became a special day already. Now, on the contrary, it is one of the merits of Hussein Radiallahu Anhu that his martyrdom took place on this blessed day. So it's the other way around, if that makes sense, right? Ashura is not blessed because of Hussein. Hussein Radiallahu Anhu is blessed because he died on this day, if that makes sense, right? Okay, moving on. Another misconception about the month of Muharram is that it is an evil or unlucky month. I don't know if you ever heard that. I've heard that. In my, you know, from Pakistan, South Asia, I've heard that in Muharram, uh, because they say, you know, Hussein was killed in this month. So we, uh, uh, people, yeah. Uh, some people, they avoid getting married in this month. Seriously. Like, I know people. I'm, I'm not lying. I know people who said Muharram, you know, if there's a wedding time coming on, they said, just do it quickly in the... Uh, well, they, no, no, they say wait for Safa, uh, Safar the next month, right? Or they say make sure you do it in uh, Dhul Hijjah. But then they said they Hajj, so maybe it's not good as well. Because whatever, for whatever reason, so they say, okay, just wait until three months later. So, But again, this is not from the Sunnah. This is not from the Sunnah of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He never ever said that any month for that, for that, for that note... He never said any month is a month of mourning. He never said any month you can't get married. Right? Marriage is something that should be done as soon as possible. Right? It's, it's something that's sacred. It's something that's encouraged. So how can, you know, be a stop for that? So, if the death of any eminent person, any special person, on a particular day, renders that day unlucky, making that day unlucky for all times to come, then one can hardly find a day of the year free from the bad luck. Why? Because every day, there might be someone on that day that was special that died. You know, oh, Omar died on that day. Oh, we can't do anything. Abu Bakr, oh, we can't. You know, <laughs> so again, the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam liberated us, alhamdulillah, from all of these superstitious beliefs. And that's what they are. Right? It might be a hard pill to swallow for some people who might be trapped in these beliefs. Right? But the fact is that they are all superstitious beliefs. And even when you hear it, it doesn't make sense. Right? But the people who are doing it, number one, they could be doing it because it's been passed on. Right? By forefathers. Right? And this is what they believe and that's it. Number two, again, the community is doing it. So again, they just blindly follow. But again, Islam is a religion that doesn't allow you to blindly follow anything, right? It makes you to think, to search, to ponder, and then do it. If you don't do these things, you might get yourself into trouble on the Day of Judgment. So, just again, <laughs> Muharram, you want to get married? Bismillah. Right, this month. Anybody want to get married? Bismillah. No problem at all, inshallah. Alright, another thing that happens on this day, um, again... We're going to be talking about this group of people. Um, <clears throat> another wrong practice, an evil practice, I would say, that happens in this month is to hold lamentation and mourning ceremonies in the memory of the martyrdom of Al Hussein. I'm going to show you some disturbing pictures because it needs to be shown. The reason I'm showing this is because people attribute Islam to this, right? Even, especially non Muslims. They look at these pictures, they say, look, they're dressed in Muslim clothing. They're calling some Arabic words. Khalas. They're Muslims. And there's some horrible pictures on the internet showing this day. Especially to children as well. It's, it makes you like, really? Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. So the Prophet sallallahu forbade us, completely forbade us from holding mourning ceremonies. Mainstream media is covered. Of course. And they, would, they, they, they love this. Because this shows... As if, you know, Islam is barbaric. Islam is violent. They, that's what they want. But again, this is not from Islam whatsoever. Mourning in Islam is allowed for how many days? Three days. Three days. When somebody passes away, you're allowed to mourn for three days. But even when you're mourning, there are things you cannot do. Right? And we'll talk about this in a bit. Even mourning has the Sharia. Right? You can't just do anything you want. Oh, I'm mourning. I'll do whatever. Nah, nah, nah. There are rules you need to follow. So, the people of Jahiliyyah, um, which is the pre-Islamic era of the ignorance, 
used to mourn over their deceased through loud lamentation. Lamentation means hitting themselves, right? Tearing their clothes and beating their cheeks and chest. So this, this is a practice of people of Jahiliya, not a practice of Islam. Indeed, the Prophet ﷺ prevented the Muslims from doing all of this and directed them to observe patience by saying what? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiyun. Right? And this is from the, the Quran. Right? Because even if you know about the hadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders the angel of death to take the soul of a child. I don't know if you know this hadith. And the angel of death takes the soul of the child and Allah asked the angel of death that how did you find the parents? Right? Any parent. Like we, we hear, you know, deaths of child children and you can't imagine what the parents are going through. Right? So Allah asked the angel of death, even though Allah knows of course. Right? But he wanted us to take a lesson from this. Allah asked the angel of death, how did you find the parents? Right? So the angel of death will say, said, not will say, said, that they observed patience and they said, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiyun. What did Allah said in response? That he said, well, in that case, there's nothing better I can give them except a house in Jannah and it'll be called patience. Right? Our religion teaches us to be patient, not to be aggressive, not to let our emotions get the better of us. Because when you let, the, it get, when you let your emotions get the better of you, you are in a drunkard state. Right? Whether it's good emotions or bad emotions. And there's actually, I'm not sure if it's a hadith or a saying of the Salaf where they say, you should never make a decision when you are too happy or too angry. Because you're, you're not thinking straight. You're just thinking from here. So when everything is going right for you, you're so happy, you're such a high, do not make a decision at that time because you might think, oh my God, why did I do that? Right? Same thing on the other side. When you're really sad, angry or something, do not make a decision. Go back to this. Again, the sunnah is to observe patience. And this is a vital hadith. Where the Rasul, and this is from Sayyid Bukhari, Rasulullah said, He is not from us who slaps his cheeks, tears his clothes, or tears his clothes, and cries in the manner of the people of Jahiliya. Three things. Slapping on the cheek is not allowed. And not just this, there's another hadith which says, like, if you want to hit someone, avoid the face. And this is why sports such as boxing or kickboxing, where you hit the face, scholars say it is haram, right? Wrestling as well, because you're hitting the face. So the, because the face is a delicate place, right? If you, you might hit face, face meaning not just this, it means the whole thing, right? Um, so slapping your cheeks, not allowed. Tearing your clothes, not allowed. And crying in a manner of the jahiliya, basically loud cries. This is not from the sunnah of the Prophet Are you allowed to cry when you face a calamity? Yes, you do. Why do we say that? Okay, but do we have any evidence of that from the Prophet Yes, we do. He cried for who? There's two examples come in my head. Khadija even when she passed away and it was a time when after many years when Khadija Radiyallahu's sister came to visit he even cried at that moment because he remembered Khadija Radiyallahu he cried when his son died as well Ibrahim Rasulullah son when Ibrahim passed away he cried and then the Sahaba asked him Ya Rasulullah even you like even you cry Rasulullah said, yes, even me. You know, because I, I have emotions as well. Right? So crying, there's nothing wrong in that. But it's the way you do it. Do not go to extremes. Remember, our religion is about the middle path. There are people who don't cry at all. And what happens is that they have a dead heart. Right? It's just, they just, 
walking zombies. Nothing affects them. So that's not a sunnah as well. But on the other side, we're not people who just say bad words and start doing anything we want when there's a calamity strike. We follow the middle path. All right, so all the jurists, all the ulama are anonymous. Basically, they have no disagreement at all that this type of mourning is unpermissible. And again, just for the record, it's got nothing to do with this beautiful religion of Islam. People can say whatever they want, that this is part of Islam, this is part of Islam, but it doesn't make it part of Islam, right? You need evidence from the Qur'an or the life of the Prophet If it doesn't come from there, then it can't be from Islam. Yeah, you can say whatever you want. So, even al Hussein, radiallahu anhu, shortly before his demise, before he passed away, he advised his beloved sister, Zainab, who was also killed, on this day of Karbala and he told her not to mourn over his death in this type of manner and there's a saying of his where he said my dear sister I swear upon you that in case I die you shall not tear your clothes nor scratch your face nor curse anyone for me or pray for your for, for your own death because some people think like that right and I, again, you know, because emotions get the better of you, right? And shaitan is looking for an opportunity. When he finds you weak, he wants to attack you. And how does he attack you? Waswas, of course, right? And some people do start saying that, you know, I hope I died rather than you. I'm sure you've heard that as well, right? But this is not from the sunnah again. We need to. It's tough. I mean, people can say, you know, talk is easy. Action is difficult. But again, this is why we need to keep asking Allah to make us people of sabr. Sabr, sabr, sabr. And that's what Allah says in the Quran. That verily, He loves those who observe patience. So again, just for the people who do these kind of things, even Hussein Allah said, don't do this. Right? There's absolutely no justification for doing any of these acts. For anyone, for that matter. So, it is evident from this advice that this type of mourning is condemned even by the blessed person for the memory of whom these mourning ceremonies are held. Every Muslim should avoid this practice and abide by the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, which makes sense. Right? Um, final reminder again, I mean obviously we are sending quite a lot of reminders about this. Fast the month of Ashura, no, no, the month of Ashura. Uh, the day of Ashura, in the month of Muharram, uh, which, as I said, for Hong Kong, is on when? Monday is? Monday, Sunday? No. Uh, Monday is the 9th of Muharram. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So, Monday is the 9th of Muharram, which is the day before Ashura. Tuesday is the day of Ashura in Hong Kong, which is the 10th of Muharram. Um, and then there are some evidence to say also fast the next day as well. And the evidence is here. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal rahimullah said, Whoever wants to fast Ashura should fast on the 9th and the 10th, unless there is some uncertainty about the months, in which case he should fast for three days. And Ibn Sarin said this as well. Now the reason why this is just to make it a bit more clear for people, why did he mention this? He wasn't the only imam to mention something about the 9th and the 10th. There are other imams who said this as well. There's a hadith which I think we missed out from this slide. There's a hadith where Rasul Wasallam said, after some time, after some years, he said when he found out that the Jews are also fasting on this day, um, he wanted to be different from them. right? And this is a sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. Every time he found a, an, an act of worship that the Jews and the Christians are also doing on a particular day, what would he do? He would say, I would do something extra or different. For example, the beard. Right? What did he say? He said, trim your, trim your mustache. Right? He never said, he, well, and the reason for that was to be different from the Jews and the Christians. Because at that time, everybody had a beard. Right? So that's just one example. So when he heard that the Jews are also fasting on the 10th of Muharram, he commanded that he said, there's a hadith, he said, if I was to live next year if i were to live next year i would fast on the 9th of muharram as well 
to be different from the Jews. But the Qadr of Allah was that he never lived for that year. He passed away before Ashura came in the following year. But the Hadith is still valid. Yeah, 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 of course. Of course. But, but Yeah, exactly, the previous years. But when he said this saying, before that Ashura came for the next year, he passed away. But the Hadith still stands, right? That we are supposed to fast on the 9th and the 10th. So, just to make it more clear, I think this is the last one, yeah. Just to make it more clear, the best thing to do is to fast all three days. 9th, 10th, 11th. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for us in Hong Kong. I keep saying this because we all need to check our local moon sightings. In the UK, it's different. Everywhere is different, right? You just need to check with your, with your, with your masjids. So the best is to fast all three days. Also, if you do this with another intention, which is when you fast three days of the month, what happens? Well, you fast three days a month, you fast three days a month. <laughs> no. Um, it's like you have fasted the whole of the month. Do you know why? Okay. The mercy of Allah in our good actions is what? When you do a good action, what does Allah do? He multiplies it by? No, no, no. When you do a good action, when you do one good action, what does Allah do? He multiplied that one by? 10 right when you do a bad action what does Allah do does he multiply by anything or does he keep it the same he keep it one right this is from the mercy of Allah so if you do three three times ten alhamdulillah <laughs> your maths is working so that's what a month just like we do for shawal remember we say if you fast the month of Ramadan follow it by six days of shawal what does the hadith says it's like you have fasted the whole year, right? And there's a mathematical formula for that as well, right? Six times tell, da, 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 da. anyway, for the full year. Same thing for this, right? That if you fast these three days, it's like you have fasted the whole of Muharram. Alhamdulillah, right? More than that, fasting, um, for one day of fasting, what does Allah do? He keeps you away from Jahannam by, I think, 80 years. Right? Which, again, we cannot even compliment, con contemplate that. Right? Another thing for fasting, of course, Allah says, fasting is the action that He will reward Himself. Right? Um, so we should never underestimate the power of fasting. Okay? Um, and, oh, Monday, another, another intention you can all make. So first, make the intention that you're doing it for Ashura. Two, you make the intention that you're doing it as the three days of the month. Three, you can make another, another intention which is Monday, because the three days in Hong Kong, well, in, in other places as well, one of the days will fall on the Monday. What is Monday? What's so special about Monday? Exactly. So it's another day where you should be observing a voluntary fast. Right? So you can make that intention as well, inshallah. Then look, I'm fast. Because Allah, you can, you can have multiple intentions. And inshallah, you get reward for all of them. If that makes sense. Rasulullah Mondays and Thursdays. No, I mean on the day of Ashura. Ashura, he couldn't fast on the next year. When he was fasting on Ashura, he was only doing Ashura, Ashura, Ashura. On the 10th. On the 10th, right? Because he was following the Sunnah of the Musa, alayhi salam. Right? But then the next year when he said, look, I want to make it different from the Jews. Meaning what? He's going to fast the day before. But he didn't live for that day. And the reason why we say three days is because as we know, as we know, sometimes we get the months wrong, the moon sighting wrong, right? And this is why, for example, the last 10 nights of Ramadan, what do we do? What do we say? That consider every single night as a night of Laylatul Qadr. Because we don't know when it could be. Yes, we are told is an, is an odd night. Yes, we are told is most likely on the 27th, the 29th, or 25th. But we don't know for sure that that's the night, right? And that's why the ulama, the scholars say, you want to be on the safe side? Consider every night of Ramadan on the last 10 nights as the possibility of Laylatul Qadr. Same thing here, right? Consider all three days as in maybe the day of Ashura, you know, Allah knows best. But if we got the moon sighting wrong, maybe the day of Ashura is Monday. 
right? But you already, if you're already fasting on Monday, Alhamdulillah, you made your, you made your point, if that makes sense, right? So try your best to fast on these three days. And that's it. Anything, any, any questions? Is that clear? Yeah? So just again on a side note, and this is something important, not just a day of Ashura, whenever we are, Allah, the Prophet Sallallahu has made the, a day special and has recorded it, what are, we, what are we commanded to do? Fast. Right? Same as, again I said, the, the day that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi was born. He never did any other celebrations. No milad, no maulid, nothing like that. Right? It was just fasting. If that makes sense. Because if we were allowed to celebrate in any way of, in any way of form, he would have commanded the Sahaba to do so. Like he commanded the Sahaba to celebrate the day of Eid. Right? When Abu Bakr anhu saw a girl praying a duff. Right? And Abu Bakr stopped her. What did Rasulullah said? say? It's the day of Eid. Let it be. Enjoy. Right? So he allowed her. Why? Because it was the day of Eid. Right? But then he, again, and, and the hadith is very clear. Rasulullah said, everyone has their own Eids. We have two Eids. And we can't add any other Eid even if we want to. Just to be clear. Okay? Any questions? Any easy questions? Wow. You're not meant for easy questions. I'm not meant for easy questions? No. Obviously, the person who's supposed to be here is not here. Uh, may Allah give his no, uncle Shifa. No, that's fine. Any questions, sisters? Anything that wasn't sure in your head? Um, anything? No? Have you, uh, did you manage to get some more information, inshallah? Yes. Managed to learn something new? Yeah? Refresh your mind? Yeah? Even the people watching online? Um, Try your best to, you know, I mean, obviously people who are watching as well, we do this every Friday, alhamdulillah. Um, next week, the topic is with Brother Isa Ma, and the topic is, ah, Islam and science. So he's going to be talking about Islam and science, especially three things, uh, the miracles of the Quran, can the religion of Islam and science be compatible? Um, so inshallah, please, if you can, do come. And Jazakallah khair. Subhanakallahumma wa hamdik nashadu la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ulaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Jazakallah khair.